got him looking. Bailey Clark escapes the jam. The 3-1, hit well to left center field. Bird is back, he is not gonna catch it. It's off the base of the wall. One run will score, Jabs is quickly behind him. He will score as well. It's a two RBI double for Andrew Kisner. And the Gateman now leads seven to nothing. Now has a two and two to Bortles. He got him. Zach Houston comes in the game and strikes out the side. Ground ball up the middle, Grand Prix spins around, throws. What a play, Preston Grand Prix. Hi, I'm Kyle Schwarber, and you're listening to Wareham Gateman Baseball. Now from the broadcast booth, welcoming you into Spillane Field, a matchup between the Wareham Gateman and the Falmouth Commodores. Again, I'm Jake Garcia. Joined alongside me is Eric Bramer, and Megan O'Brien will be on throughout the broadcast. These teams in a deadlock for third place in the Western Division and getting set to do battle here at Spillane. First pitch is scheduled for 7 o'clock. Lineups are being introduced right now. Should mention that it's a pretty hot one, or at least by Cape Cod standards. 84 degrees and sunny was 88 earlier. We saw the Gateman take batting practice in shorts and t-shirt. A little deviation from what they normally do in taking it in baseball pants. But great baseball weather should be a fun one here tonight. We'll run through the lineups now. Present you the visiting Jeff Trundy's Falmouth Commodores lineup first. Caleb Hamilton's at shortstop and batting leadoff. Boomer White's batting second and playing left field. Evan Skaug is over at first base and batting third. J.J. Matajevic is batting cleanup and in right field. He's as hot at the plate as it is outside right now. Tate Blackman's batting fifth and playing third base. J.B. Woodman's in center and batting sixth. Logan Ice, the Oregon State catcher, is batting seventh. Shane Bennis is DHing and batting eighth. And Nick Lavello rounds out the lineup. He's batting ninth and playing second. You mentioned J.J. Matic-Jevic playing very good baseball as of late and the batting average at 303, which is impressive, but made even more impressive when you consider where he was about 100 points lower just a couple weeks ago. Two weeks ago, 207, now checking in at 303. Notable out of the lineup for the Commodores, Heath Quinn, who has punished the baseball against the Gateman. Six for 11 with a triple, but not in the lineup tonight. The two head coaches are out near home plate, conferencing with the home plate umpiring crew that is headed by Charlie Chirko, and at first is Frank Graney, and at third is Mike Collier. We'll now introduce you the Wareham Gateman's lineup presented by head coach Cooper Ferris. Andrew Kalika is batting leadoff and in center field. Jay Jabs is batting second and in right. Nick Sieri's the DH batting third. Andrew Kisner batting cleanup and at first base. Gavin Stepensky, the new guy, putting down the signs behind the plate and batting fifth. John Sternagel, who, like Matt Ajevic, is white hot right now. He's batting sixth and playing third. Logan Sowers in left field and batting seventh. Preston Grand Prix gets the notch up in the lineup, batting eighth and at short. And Kramer Robertson will round things out in the nine hole and playing second base. A couple noticeable absences. Mark Caraviotis, just a little banged up. He's out of the lineup today, and so is Dave McKinnon, who missed Sunday's game after being hit by a foul ball on Saturday. We'll set the stage a little bit more now, talk about what these two teams have done recently. Before an off day yesterday, the Gateman mustered three runs against Katuit. They ended up falling to Katuit in eight innings by a score of five to three. Mike Roberts had a definite say in that, ending the game as soon as daylight pretty much evaporated. But for the Gateman, three runs in that game, only the second time in 13 games, scoring more than two runs. They switched things up for BP today, taking it in short, switching up the order a bit, so we'll see if that leads to more offensive success. On the flip side, the Falmouth Commodores have been in a bit of a standstill. They haven't been going in reverse like the Gatemen have, but 5-4-1 in their last 10 games. That one tie happened to be the last game they played. It was a crazy one against the first place Hyannis Harborhawks. Went into the ninth with a five-run lead. Hyannis proceeds to score five in the ninth, and ultimately the lights go out at the Hyannis ballpark, and they end up tying. And remember way back in June when the Gateman played the Commodores here at Spillane Field, the Commodores also dealt with the lightning slash rain delay and then the game calling on account of the sprinklers. So they've encountered pretty much every kind of delay that you can have so far here in the Cape League season. These teams have played four times this season, but one meeting that didn't come till. June 23rd, that was the last meeting between these two teams, so over a month since they've seen each other after 
quite a series of encounters that featured three within a week. We'll now send you out to our crowd mic for the presentation of our national anthem. Excellently executed, and now we're about set to do things from Spillane. See a ceremonial first pitch that'll be delivered into home plate. No one from the Gateman has stepped out yet, and now it in, is indeed the catcher, Gavin Stepensky. To finish up a point that I was trying to make but unsuccessfully didn't make but before the national anthem, these teams have played four times already. The last time was on June 23rd. Falmouth won that game 4-0. The Gateman took the first game of this six-game season-long series by a score of 10-1. Since then, though, Falmouth has won on three occasions. Interesting to point out that on four of the five occasions now, these teams have come in with identical records. They come in tonight, both 13-19-1. and one. In the first game of the season, 0-1, then 3-4, then 4-5, Game number four of the series kind of ruined that stat, but these teams have been deadlocked all season long, and by the looks of it, they don't seem to be separating themselves very much. And I'm torn on my appraisal of this Commodore squad. We, of course, haven't seen them in about a month, so it'll be interesting to see what changes they've made. Keep in mind that the last time Falma saw Wareham, the Gatemen were without Andrew Kalika and some other pretty big parts of this lineup. But the Commodores have won three of these four games. The one game they did not win was a blowout victory in favor of the Gatemen. But by all accounts, everyone else in the league seems to think that these two teams are about equal, and the records reflect that. Run differentials for both teams. Wareham at minus 10, Falmouth at minus 44. It's a very similar Falmouth lineup that we've seen trotted out by Jeff Trundy on the four other occasions coming into this game. The notable exception is the guy in the three-hole today, Evan Skaug, who was just a mammoth freshman in the middle of a TCU potent batting order. He's in the middle of the Falmouth order tonight, due up third against Crook on the mound. Defensively for the Gateman, left to right in the outfield, Logan Sowers, Andrew Kalika, and Jay Jabs. At the corners in the infield, Sternagel's at third and Kisner's at first. Preston Grand Prix and Kramer Robertson make up the double play combination. Gavin Stepensky is putting down the signs again for the left-hander in Crook. I'm paying atten attention to Crook's warm-up tosses. He's yet to throw a strike. There's one. But perhaps having some trouble with the pitcher's mound or his landing area, now brushing away some more dirt, trying to get something consistent. And consistency is important in your mechanics and in the place in which your right foot, in the case of the lefty Crook, lands. Crook, a 6'4", left-handed pitcher out of San Mateo, California, goes to Oregon, 0-1 this season with a 7.94 ERA. This will be his fourth start for the game. Only gone five and two-thirds, hasn't gotten out of the second inning yet. His first pitch of the ball game to Caleb Hamilton is a fastball that misses on the outside corner. First pitch time here at Spillane, 7.03 local time. 
Again, 83, 84 degrees. Shadows already in play as Crook delivers ball two, missing outside. Crook standing in the direct sunlight. Meanwhile, the hitter in the batter's box is in the shade. Shadows also, of course, an issue for pickoff moves over on first, so Kisner will have to deal with that. There's a strike. Crook in there with the fastball. Hamilton, the leadoff man, shortstop from Oregon State, hitting 200 on the season, trying to get on base against Crook. Crook's 2-1 is a fastball, catching the outside corner to even the count. The Gatemans lost against Katuit, dropped them to losers of their last seven in road ball games. So it's a welcome sight to be back here at home. Off the glove of Stepensky and all the way to the backstop. The count runs full. Boomer White on deck. We'll also pay attention to Stepensky behind the plate. We saw him in the late innings of Sunday's game. But we're told that he's a pretty good defensive catcher. Here's Crook's payoff pitch. Rocketed over to Sternagel. Off his glove, but he stays with it. And his throw across the diamond in time to retire Hamilton. Not your conventional first out, but I'm sure Sternagel will take it. And that might be the hardest hit ball we've seen off Crook all year. I mentioned in the open that his last start against uh, Chatham was the first time he had really given up any runs or anything that was his doing. But even at that, there were about four infield singles, if I remember correctly, that kind of felled him and took him out of the game in the second. Crook racks up strikeouts in bunches. Eight strikeouts compared to 5.2 innings this season. But like you mentioned as well, the trouble has been walks. Six walks this season, so more walks than innings pitch. Two of them came against Chatham. In his last outing, he allowed five earned runs. So looking for a bounce-back performance here against the Commodores. Misses with two straight balls of the two-hitter, Boomer White. If you're looking at Crook for the first time and you're wondering what makes him special, it's the fact that he's a left-handed pitcher throwing in the low 90s with a lot of movement on his pitches. Into his windup and now into the plate. Bounced into the glove of Stepensky. The count quickly 3 0. Oh. Scout. Scout, the dangerous three hitter on deck. We have access, if we ask and if we pay close enough attention, to very advanced statistics on the ball delivery. The 3 0, oh, now 3 1 as a fastball from Crook is in there. And Crook's RPM, his spin rate, is vastly superior to pretty much everyone else in the Cape Cod League. Here's his three and one offering in the dirt. Did he go around? Yes, he did. So the count runs full. Matt Crook has battled back from a 3-0 count. Now it's three and two. White has started in now four of the five contests in which the Commodores have faced the Gateman. Doesn't have a hit yet in his three starts prior. 0 for 11. Crook to the plate, the payoff pitch is a fastball on the outside corner for strike three. Not sure if too many agreed with that one. White certainly didn't, but nevertheless, it's two outs here in the first for Crook. Yeah, a generous outside corner here in the first inning. I don't think too many people will have any complaints as long as that's called consistently for both sides. It'll be something to monitor as the game progresses. See if that outside corner is there for Turner Larkins, the opposing pitcher against Crook. Skaug now into the left-handed batter's box. Like I mentioned, the freshman from TCU. First pitch of the at-bat is a spinner. Spins too much, though, in front of Stepensky. Skaug had three hits in his last game against Hyannis, which raised his season average to 283. Coming into this game, riding a modest four-game hitting streak. Crooks, 1-0. Right across the heart of the plate. Good fastball there, evening the count at one. Both of these teams, four games back of the first place Hyannis Harbor Hawks. So by no means out of the race for the West Crown. Now it's on the inside corner. Crook ahead in the count now, one and two. Maybe that's just the side of the plate that the umpire's favoring tonight. Again, we'll monitor going forward. Crooks, 1-2 offering, breaking ball, missing at the shoe tops, 2-2. Two two. 
That's the wild thing about this Western Division. As poorly as the Gatemen played over the past couple of weeks, they are still not out of it if they put together a winning streak, as teams are known to do out here. Crook winds and delivers the 2-2. Bayou for strike three. 1-2-3 inning for Matt Crook. Two strikeouts as well. On to the bottom of the first, 0-0 at Spillane on WCTV. Back out at Spillane Field, Jake Garcia, Eric Bramer, and Megan O'Brien on hand to deliver you a matchup between the Gatemen and the Commodores. We'll set the stage defensively for the Commodores. Left to right in the outfield, it's Boomer White, J.B. Woodman, and J.J. Matajevic. At the corners in the infield, Tate Blackman and Evan Skaug, third base and first base respectively. The double play combination is Caleb Hamilton at short, Nick Lavello at second, Logan Ice behind the plate, putting down the signs for his starting right-hander, Turner Larkins. Let's talk a little bit more about Larkins, a 6'3", 205 sophomore, calls Texas A&M home. This season, kind of a mixed bag of results. Yeah, the one bad start is a seven earned run performance. Other than that, he's been about pedestrian, which in this league is worse than average. But he's shown flashes of being a very good pitcher. He's not going more than five innings. The thing that stuck out to me is his name, Turner Larkins. That's got to be the most Arlington, Texas name that I've ever heard. He goes to Texas A&M. A guy who went to Texas A&M was Johnny Manziel. In the MLB draft, Larkins was selected a pick before Manziel was. There you go. How I came across that, I have no idea. He's about set to deliver the first pitch to the leadoff man for the Gateman Kalika. Larkins this season, 0-2 with a 6-4 ERA. This will be his fifth start. A 1.67 whip, which means he allows his fair share of base runners. 16.2 innings pitched this season. 12-7 to strikeout to walk ratio. The 2-0 laced into center field. Kalika's aboard with a leadoff hit. What's new? Not a whole lot is new. Kalika, his average will go up from 379. He was in a bit of a slump, went 0 for 11 at one point, but had a two-hit performance, two-RBI performance in his last game against Katuit. And here for the Gateman, he's on early. As recently as July 14th, his on-base percentage was above 500 at 509. Now coming into the game at 438, that'll go up. But he has to be impressing scouts at this point. A 380 on base percentage is above average. Jabs takes a hack at the first pitch and skies one into foul territory. Looks like Skaug will have room, though. He indeed does out number one. Jabs down quickly, and now it's the three hitter and another lefty, Nick Sierra. The thing that is interesting to me about Kalika and we'll continue to talk about him because he's been a bright spot for this Gateman team. One extra base hit, that was a home run. We've seen some extra base pop in batting practice, and he's been hitting the ball hard, but no doubles and no triples so far this year. His hard hits have gone right at people pretty much. They've found holes, but none of them have been in the gaps yet. You'd expect that to change, especially with his speed. And speaking of speed... Four for six on steals this year has a pretty big lead over on first. Larkins pays homage to that and will fire over there. I thought you were going to say, speaking of speed, Nick Sieri at the plate. <laughs> that too. Sieri has a stolen base this season. I, If you were to put a gun to my head, I would say it probably stays at one. But he's up there to mash, and that's why he checks in with a 358 average. Ball one, a fastball outside. Sieri, like Kalika, does not have too many extra base hits. In fact, only one. But the frame is there, the power is there to develop into a pretty dangerous hitter. Again, Larkins checks on Kalika, and this ball gets past Skaug over at first. He'll have enough time to recover, though. Kalika thought about it, but probably wisely on his part, stayed put on first. Sierra's only extra base hit was a double hit down the left field line, and we've seen most of his hits go that way this year. Certainly likes working to all parts of the field. It's a strength of his, but we've yet to see him pull the ball with authority. Meanwhile, Kalika over on first has 
set his point in the dirt in which he wants to get to on his lead. It's enough to threaten Larkins on the mound, but obviously not enough to pick him off. Leaning over towards second, he started to go but does not. Sierra down the left field line, fouling out of play. You saw Kalika leaning there too, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of hesitated. Maybe the jump wasn't there. Cooper Ferris loves to get his guys in action. And in the first with the leadoff runner on, I wouldn't be surprised to see him do it again. Larkins from the stretch. Here's his delivery to the plate. Across the plate, strike two. Sierra down in a one and two count, trying to have a productive at bat here in the first in a scoreless ball game. Kalika takes off, the pitch is outside. His head for slide into second base. He's in there. Fifth stolen base of the season for Kalika and his fifth in a row. And now Sierra with an RBI opportunity. For a team that does not have too many extra base hits to their names, that's how you have to score runs. We were talking with the Commodore broadcasters earlier today and we said well so far if you had to point to one thing that has led to the Gateman struggles it's that they have to string two or three hits together to get a run more often than not three hits and if they can get stolen bases and they have been aggressive on the base paths just not a whole lot of success if they can be aggressive and have success that can add to some more runs here's the 2-2 pitch a breaking ball fouling out of play over by the high school That inclination not to hit for extra bases that the Gateman have this season has also really manifested itself in two, three-run ball games in which they're behind. They really don't have a hitter who comes to the plate that you know with one swing of the bat can tie the game for them. Here in the first, though, it's 0-0. Larkins to the plate and three straight foul balls from Sierra. Sierra with six RBIs on the season, looking to cash in number seven. With Kalika's speed on second, a base hit to the outfield will likely score this game's first run. Larkin set at the leather, leathers. Here he is to the plate. His 2-2 pitch is a little bit too far inside. Some barking from the Falmouth dugout. They know that was there in the first half of the first. Yeah, a very close pitch, but a good take by Sierra now that it's been called a ball. We'll see how aggressive Larkins is to Sierra with first base open. There's that Falmouth dugout headed by Jeff Trundy. Payoff pitch with Kisner on deck awaiting. Larkins to the plate. Ground ball chopped over to Hamilton. He fields and on to first, but Kalika will advance 90 feet. Wisely on his part, that ball, though it was hit right at him, was hit slowly enough to allow him to take third. Not necessarily a productive at-bat, but it could certainly turn into one should a pass ball get behind ice or turn or uncork a wild pitch. Things will be left to Kisner. The batting average low for a cleanup hitter at 208, but he's shown some signs in the past couple games of turning things around. A lot of hard hit outs. Most notably an opposite field double in the Gateman's last home game. Ball one on the outside corner. Early on, Kisner looked like he was going to put together a season in which he led the league in doubles. He was a doubles machine at NC State as well. Got into a bit of a rut, and he looks to be getting out of it now. Larkins is 1-0. Breaking ball that misses low, ball two. Hitters count for the cleanup hitter tonight, Andrew Kisner. Had seen Kisner consistently in the 5-6 hole in these past few games. Now with an opportunity to justify Cooper Ferris' selection of him as the cleanup man. 
Count goes to two and one as Larkins gets a fastball that catches the outside corner. Larkins nods in agreement with his catcher, Logan Ice, and here's his two and one offering. Fastball, maybe a slider there. It misses outside regardless. Logan Ice had to swipe his glove across to keep it from getting to the backstop. Three and one count. The new guy and the catcher, Gavin Stepensky, on deck. Larkins to the plate. Fastball that misses high. Kisner aboard. Now we'll see the first at-bat and first plate appearance of Gavin Stepensky's Gateman career. Came in as a defensive replacement. The Gateman's last affair against Katua. Didn't come to the plate, though. So we saw him take a few hacks in batting practice. And really the scouting report and the rationale for the Gateman bringing him in was that he hit for a bit of power. Had some good slugging percentages and OPS numbers at UNC Wilmington this past season. Now in line to collect his first RBI if he can have a base hit. Larkins, a fastball that misses on the outside. He's also a good enough defensive catcher, or so we're told, that if he hits, he can find himself playing every day for the rest of the season. You never know. His teammates like him, too. Talking to guys like Grand Prix, Kalika, Charlie Warren before the game. Positive support for Stepensky in his Gateman career as it kicks off here tonight. Two outs, bottom of the first. Scoreless ball game. Larkins is 1-0. Another fastball and again misses outside. Logan Ice out to the mound. See the very few clouds in the sky here at Spillane Field. A perfect night for baseball. I wouldn't mind a little bit more of a breeze. Yeah, this is probably pretty hot for you. That's fine. This is like a Minnesota summer. But uh, I just don't want to see you put on some long sleeves as soon as the sun goes down. Now this is brilliant. I'll take this for the rest of the summer. The 2-0 pitch to Stepensky, laced into the right center gap. It drops and it could go for extra bases. Kalika in easily. Kisner motoring into third. He'll be sent to the plate. Here's the throw from Lavello from second. Not in time. Kisner slides in safely. What a slide from Andrew Kisner to avert the tag of Logan Ice. A two RBI double for Gavin Stepensky to kick off his Gateman career. That was a pretty good relay from right field Matajevic to Lavello. Then the throw was pl in plenty of time. Two ice at the plate, but Kisner, as you mentioned, a brilliant slide to the dugout side of the third base line, dicking, ducking his left arm and touching the plate there. No hesitation from Cooper Ferris over at third either. He saw as soon as the ball was sent to Lavello and his guy was touching third, being no doubter to send it. Had to execute the cutoff perfectly, which the Commodores did to their credit. But ultimately it was Kisner who gave a little belly roll slide into the plate. So the Gateman out to an early 2-0 lead. Good news for them because they really struggle this season when opponents score first. Now it's arguably their hottest hitter, John Sternagel, to the plate and looking for more. Larkins is offering, grounded over to Hamilton. Out number three here on the first inning, but not before the Gateman plate two runs. Gavin Stepensky goes for extra bases. We head to the top of the second, 2-0 Gateman on the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. Pops out at Spillane Field, and they're happy. The Gateman with an early 2-0 lead as we head to the second inning. Four, five, and six for the Commodores. Crook has some run support. Always a good sign. This will likely be his last inning of work. Again, it all depends on pitch count, but from what we've been told, it'll be Zach Houston to likely follow in the third. It would have to be a very quick second inning because I don't think they want him to go out for the third inning and then have to leave when he reaches his approximate 45 pitch count. Pretty good crowd on hand tonight. You can see the scouts behind home plate. That's nothing new for a start of Matt Crook. 
They come out in droves to watch a very highly touted prospect from Oregon. So the Gatemen get two on the bottom of the first to Gavin Stepensky, two out, two RBI double, which played a Kalika easily from third and then Kisner all the way from first. Now it's J.J. Matajevic, the left-handed hitter from U of A. We mentioned that he has been tearing the cover off the baseball. Looks like the size of a beach ball right now to him. Takes a hack at the first pitch and fouls one back. He's been the Commodore's all-around best hitter, leading in average home runs and RBIs. And we mentioned lately has really been the name of his game, a 10-game hitting streak coming into this game. In that 10-game hitting streak, six of them were of the multi-hit variety. Crook bounces one into home plate. Stepensky showcasing, even with no one on base, some good instincts. Matajevic two weeks ago was hitting 207 because of his outburst, now hitting 303. And this ball picked over at first by Kisner, who will race over and tag the bag. A hard out, but an out nonetheless for Crook. Kisner showing off his shortstop instincts. He played shortstop through high school, then third base in college, and compared to those positions, first base is easy. You just have to catch throws, and sometimes you have to make plays like that. I think the common denominator with every position he's played in his career, you have to have soft hands. And on a play like that, soft hands definitely required. Flashes some leather and picks it on a short hop for out number one. Blackman now to the plate and swinging at the first pitch foul. Showing some confidence, too, in his ability to pick that off to the side. Someone who's less experienced, perhaps even more fundamentally sound in some respects, might go over and try and block that ball. But if Kisner does that and he doesn't catch it in the glove, he might not be able to get over to first in time. Perhaps someone as well who realizes the skill set that they have and I don't know if too many first basemen are as athletic as Kisner is so knowing their limitations maybe they wouldn't approach that play the same way Tate Blackman watches three pitches go by or rather the third of that at bat he's down the third strikeout for Matt Crook That was a pretty filthy curveball there. Buckled the knees of Blackman. Yes, it was, and made even more filthy by the fact that it complements his fastball, which, as we said at the outset, low 90s with movement. A pair of Ole Miss teammates in the 5-6 and six hole. Now it's the guy who's batting 6, J.B. Woodman. He shows bunt on pitch number 1, but... Crook counters by breaking off a curveball all over the plate, strike one. Woodman this season, a 2.30 average, has started all four of these games prior to this one against Wareham and hasn't hit in each of them. Count quickly 0-2. Woodman has struck out a lot this season. In fact, 39 total strikeouts. Most in the Cape League will see if Matt Crook can make it number 40 for Woodman and number four for him. His 0-2 pitch with two outs. Curveball on the outside corner, strike three. Four strikeouts through two innings for Matt Crook. On to the bottom of the second, the Gateman with a 2-0 lead. 2-0 Gateman as we head to the bottom of the second inning. Before this shot of Turner Larkins delivering balls into home plate, we saw Matt Crook and his teammate from Oregon, Mark Caraviotis, heading over towards the Gateman bullpen. That'll likely mean that the outing of Crook is over and he'll seed to a new pitcher. But he was excellent in his two innings of work. Yeah, I imagine that he did not reach his pitch count, but they don't want to bring him into another inning for him to not finish it. So he'll probably throw the rest of his pitches that he would throw on the mound instead out in the bullpen. Get his prescribed dosage, so to speak, and then Zach Houston, we presume, will come in to replace him on the mound. Saw him giving high fives to his teammates, hat off, hat in hand. By far his best start of the season as Logan Sowers, the seven hitter, watches a fastball sail by high and tight. Crook this season had allowed base runners in each of his three starts. His first start of the year was probably his best up to this point, allowed two hits, 
Then he went four walks against Katua in two innings and allowed five earned runs against Chatham. But today against the Commodores, four strikeouts and no base runners. His offense now with the bats in their hand. Sowers watches a breaking ball catch the inside corner for strike two. Let's remember too though that three of those five earned runs that Crook gave up against Chatham were post-mortem. They were left on base with the bases loaded and things just got worse when he left. Bouncing ball up the middle and into center field. Sowers aboard with a base knock. Second straight inning in which the Gatemen have reached their leadoff runner aboard via base hit. And good to see Sowers swinging the bat even though he's not really driving the ball getting base hits and getting on base. Not to spoil any, any impending surprises, but we'll have more on Sowers later in this broadcast. Now Preston Grand Prix, the eight hitter. Pickoff move over to first where Sowers gets back. Larkins from the stretch. Sowers takes off. Looks like a hit and run. This ball looped into right field and falling quickly, but foul. Didn't look like a pitch that Grand Prix would normally swing at, but he did an admirable job getting the bat on the ball, and he almost had a base hit to show for it. Just like Sowers, Grand Prix has started to come around lately at the plate. Comes into this game with a 182 average, so ever so slowly is ticking his way up to the 200 mark. Hits in three of his last four. We'll see if head coach Cooper Ferris decides to keep the hit and run on or if he asks his eight hitter to lay down a bunt. And Grand Prix will indeed square the third baseman Blackman charging quickly. Instead, Larkins opts to throw to first. Again, Grand Prix shows bunt. It's high and tight and right into the glove of Blackman who crashes quickly and puts it away with a sliding catch. Almost a good bunt, but Blackman had anticipated it and he was coming in, able to catch it for out number one. Cooper Ferris over now in the left field line, taking an extended walk. That's probably the deepest any third base coach has ever given signs. <laughs> the Gatemen were unsuccessful in a sack bunt in their last game, and he singled that out in a post-game interview, saying that an inability to execute the fundamentals is something that drives him crazy, and there Grand Prix with the pitch high and tight bunted it straight in the air to Blackman. The light's on at Spillane Field as the sun sets. Kramer Robertson, the nine hitter, before the top of the lineup will dig in. Ball one on a fastball. Robertson, the LSU second baseman, has a 262 average coming into this game. Larkins from the stretch and now to the plate. Robertson gives one a ride into center field, but playable for Woodman. Two away here in the bottom of the second, now the top of the order. Sauer's not known for his speed at first base, but I wouldn't be surprised if they try and send him on motion, maybe on the second pitch of this at bat, try and get him into scoring position for Kalika. Well, the first inning went through in a very similar way. The Gateman got Kalika aboard to start things off, then two outs. Somewhere in between, Kalika stole second base, so we'll see if Sowers attempts to steal second with Kalika at the plate in two outs. Larkin still from the stretch. Kalika has singled and scored a run. Sowers being held on at first by TCU's guy Evan Skaug. Sowers is leaning on first. We'll see if he goes. He does indeed. The pitch, probably a strike, and Sowers is head first slide into second. Gunned down by Logan Ice. I wish I wasn't right. Sowers caught stealing to end the second inning. We head to the third, 2-0 Gateman.
A new face into the game for the Gateman. It's the right-hander Zach Houston as Matt Crook gives way to a relief game for the Gateman. But now we'll go to a familiar face in Megan O'Brien who has more on the evolution and transitioning of Logan Sowers. Thanks, Jake. That's right. I spoke with Logan Sowers earlier today, and in the last game against Katua, we saw Sowers come from behind an 0-2 count and work a walk, and then his next at bat, he had a hit, and I spoke to him during batting practice today, and I said, what are you feeling about your approach at the plate? And he told me that he really feels like he's locked in in that walk at Katua, which after he went down 0-2, he fouled off three or four balls. He said that was a turning point for him, and he feels like from here on out, he's going to be swinging the bat. Single to the middle, and that's what this Gateman's. Thank you, Megan. Yeah, Sowers singled in the second inning, one for three with a walk against Katuit. So after a pretty rough start to the season, maybe starting to find his groove at the plate, taking walks certainly aids in that cause. Matt Crook was perfect through two innings, notched four strikeouts and then a pair of ground outs. Now he'll give way to the right-hander from Mississippi State, Zach Houston. Houston has seen his velocity decline a little bit since he began working on his breaking pitches, and that's something that's a necessary adjustment for Houston. Early on, even against the Commodores in the season, he had a lot of success just blowing fastballs by hitters at 93, 94 miles per hour. But that's not going to work at the next level, so he's been trying to work on mixing up his pitches. He's gotten hit around a little bit since doing that, but it's something that is a growing pain, I guess. Here are his stats this season. His Win-loss record really doesn't tell the full story like is so often the case with win and loss records, but I'll give it to you anyway. He's 0-4. A 1.69 ERA coming into this game. Four games started, but this will be his eighth appearance, so fourth in relief as well. 24 strikeouts in 21 innings. His last came against Orleans on the 14th. 7, 8, and 9 for the Commodores as they try and work their way back from a 2-0 deficit. Houston has also been failed by his defense. He's given up more unearned runs this year than earned runs. Nine runs and four of them are earned. He has Logan Ice quickly in a one and two hole. Ice the catcher today for the Commodores from Oregon State. Houston winds and delivers. Foul tipped into the glove and then out of the glove of Stepensky. Could have been strike three, but instead, we'll do things again with a one and two count. Logan Ice had been splitting catching duties for quite some time with the guy at the start of the season who we saw a lot of, Michael Tinsley. But Tinsley slumped a bit at the plate, and Ice has gotten the bulk of the starts. Houston winds and delivers his one two. Some chin music there. Logan Ice has to duck and dance out of the way. We're in the top of the third. The Gateman scored two runs on a two RBI double from Gavin Stepensky in the bottom of the first. Houston into his first inning of work. The count runs full with Shane Bennis on deck. Matt Crook turned in his best start of the year, going two perfect innings. We'll see how long the leash is for Houston. Heard rumblings that Grant Dyer may follow him, possibly Ben Parr, Sean Anderson as well. Here's the payoff pitch off the fists of ice and over the third base side bleachers. The Spillane faithful, a slew of kids charging after that ball, full speed ahead, and we have a winner. A winner in relative terms. How come? Eh, it's a baseball. Cape League baseball. Perhaps a prize possession to some. A 3-2 payoff pitch is high and off the glove of Stepensky. Won't matter, though, because Ice is taking his time unstrapping all of his body armor. He's on first to lead off the third. Here's the thing about baseballs. I definitely understand the sentimental attachment to a, a foul ball or a home run ball that you caught. But chasing after one that wasn't really hit at you, I think loses a little bit of its luster. Would you agree? 
Yeah, but that's coming from my going into my junior year in college mind. <laughs> to the mind of a six, seven, eight year old. I suppose. Even probably for me when I was twelve, that would have meant the world to me. I'm sure somewhere in my room I have a North Woods League baseball that I chased after at a St. Cloud River Bats game back in the day, but I don't know. I think it would mean more if you got someone to autograph it, but you'd have to play your cards right and have a correct guess as to who is going to go on to the major leagues. That's the thing. The Gatemen do have autograph nights occasionally. And yes, they do. Sunday night here at Spillane Field. Come out, bring a baseball, or catch one. Ball two, a fastball misses high to Bennis. Now here comes Lawler. And the trainer, and the trainer as well. Trainer. Yeah. As Houston is wincing and hands on knees, something probably isn't right. Grabbing at his side. Oblique, Oblique perhaps. injuries yep. are never good. No. They can be bothersome, and they can linger, too. Hopefully it's just a cramp that's also very possible in this heat. Waller motioning down to the bullpen, trying to... Get someone hot and quickly. Looks like Ben Parr, perhaps, in the bullpen. Cooper Ferris has reiterated that he professes to this team on off days, drink lots of water, treat your body well. Whether or not that actually happens is another story, and who knows if Houston listened to that or not, but still it's hot here at Spillane tonight, 85 degrees. Dehydration from today may even just be setting in. See Who knows? This is all just speculation. Yeah, you see a lot of players on this team carry around entire gallons of water or whatever other liquid they prefer to drink around game time. Houston, after walking Logan Ice and throwing two pitches to Shane Bennis, has now been removed from the game. So with that, we'll take a quick break here at Spillane. Looks like a right-hander and a left-hander warming up in the Gateman bullpen. But so we're not stalling for five, six, seven minutes. We'll take a quick break and then come back on the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. Back out at Spillane Field, score 2-0 Gateman over the Falmouth Commodores. This will now be the third pitcher of the game for Wareham. Matt Crook started things off. Zach Houston faced a batter in point two I guess after throwing two balls to Shane Bennis he departed though with an unknown side injury could be cramps could be oblique and gives way to Grant Dyer a left or rather a right-handed pitcher from UCLA Dyer's been pretty good the ERA at 2.38 making his sixth appearance fifth out of the bullpen limited action at 11 and a thirds as one would expect from a reliever but only three earned runs two unearned 13 strikeouts and four walks, only seven hits allowed. His whip is under one by just a hair. Some good calculations there. Adding up hits, walks, and if they're less than the amount of innings pitch, then it's under one. My mental math is at a 12th grade level. Dyer's last outing came on July 15th against Chatham. Didn't fare too well in that one. His whip was above one in that outing, allowing a hit and two walks in one inning. His best outing of the season, though, came on the 10th against Hyannis. Went extended relief 2.1 and struck out six. Now he comes into a situation in which he inherits Logan Ice on first, and he'll have to work from behind to Bennis, who watched two balls sail by from Houston. Bennis, a 152 average, the DH today from Missouri. Back on June 23rd, was, which was the last time these two teams played, he hit a home run in that game. Part of a 4-0 win for Falmouth. The bullpen, already on fire, both literally and figuratively. Guys have had to warm up quickly because... It's been a merry-go-round on the mound for the Gateman up to this point. The catcher, Stepensky, out to have a few words with Dyer. They pat each other on the chest, and now we're finally ready for some more baseball. Yeah. 
Dyer pants up, high stirrups. What he's adjusting right now and forcing Bennis to wait around a little bit. Remember, too, that this count is 2-0. and Houston left in the middle of an at-bat. So Dyer in an even more complex situation than it would look at first blush. Dyer from the stretch, his 2-0 pitch, a swing and a miss from Bennis, 2-1. Dyer does work out of the windup when no runners are on base, but since ice is over at first, relegated to a stretch roll. His 2-1 pitch, some cheddar that pops the glove of Stepensky, but too far inside. Three balls with a nine-hitter Nick Lavello on deck. Middle infield hoping to turn a pair on a ground ball. The third baseman, Sternagel, not really anticipating bunt, playing well in the dirt, deeper than the average third baseman would. Outfield straight away as we await the 3-1 and one from Dyer. To the plate, and yes, he did, says the home plate umpire. 3-2. and two. Charlie Churko behind home plate making that call, and while it goes in the favor of the Gateman, Usually both sides would agree that appealing down to first is probably the safer call. Ice the catcher over on first. Remains to be seen if he'll be taking off with nobody out. But a 3-2 and two count. He bluffs the steal, does not go, and a foul ball off the mask of Stepensky. Looked like a glancing blow and no ill effects, at least from this angle. Dyer takes a stroll off the mound. Now he's back on top. His payoff pitch awaits. The 3-2, Dyer to the plate. Strike three, swinging. A fastball gets Bennis, one out. Now Lavello to the plate into the right-handed batter's box. He's at second base today for the Falmouth Commodores, but has gained national attention this season from the media and how often he switched around. Play short, can play third. Play some outfield too and I'd guess he can play first and catcher if he absolutely wanted to. Strike one that he doesn't agree with but a good fastball there from Dyer. Keep in mind too that the Commodore is still looking for their first hit. Ice at first reached on a walk to lead off this inning. And Ice over on first is their first base runner of this game. Lavello serves one into right field, jabs back tracks, and puts it away for out number two. Now we'll flip things over to the top of the order. Caleb Hamilton, who bounced out to Sternagel, will be due up. Ice over on first, but Dyer has gotten two outs. In his first two batters, he's facing his outing. Kisner, pants already dirty from that fantastic slide to score run in the first. Ball in the dirt, the runner takes off. The throw from Stepensky in plenty of time to Kramer Robertson. Gavin Stepensky is having himself a day. Two RBIs, and now he throws out a runner to end the top half of the third. On to the bottom of the third, 2-0 Gateman on the Cape Cod Baseball League Network and WCTV. 2-0 Gateman and the top of the order due up in Kalika, Jabs, and Sieri as we head to the bottom of the third inning. The two runs for the Gateman came on one swing of the bat. Gavin Stepensky in the first roped a two RBI double. And he showcased a strong arm to end the top of the third, very similar to how the bottom of the second was ended when Logan Ice, the catcher for the Commodores, threw out Sowers. So both catchers now have a caught stealing to their name in this game. Kalika, who's one for one, a stolen base and a run, already filling up the box score, will dig into the left-hander's box. We are fast approaching the All-Star game, in which Kalika will be the starting outfielder. We presume center field, because that's all he's played. That should be exciting. 
usually the pitchers only go one inning, but Kalika, the starter, will maybe get a chance to get a couple of bats in. Good breaking ball there from Turner Larkins, a quick strike one. It's not a haughty assumption on our part to think that Kalika will be starting center field either, just because that's the only position we've seen him play. He's probably, if not the fastest, certainly one of the fastest in the league. Yeah, and that's despite not having the most impressive sprint time at the Fenway workout. Sharply hit into center field, but right at J.B. Woodman. Kalika's hit the ball hard twice now, but here in the bottom of the third, he's retired one out. I don't think he has explosive speed like some of the guys that we've seen, but he has a very agile frame and able to track balls down very well in the outfield. He's instinctually fast, let's say. Yeah, has a very quick first step, and that's what makes him great at tracking ball de balls down in center field and s swiping bases as well. Pretty much all of that relies on instincts rather than explosive speed. Jabs takes a strike. Now a nub shot back towards the center of the diamond. Hamilton, the shortstop, races in and fires on to first, out number two. A very close play, but a very nice play by Hamilton. He's shown some range at shortstop so far today and really over the course of the season. Looking at this Falmouth Commodore teams, a lot can be determined about the nature of this team, I guess, by looking at some league ranks. They're last in runs scored this season, last in RBIs as well, last in Team ERA. So what are they good at? Well, they play really good defense, as we saw right there from Caleb Hamilton. Don't make a lot of errors. And also lead the Cape Cod Baseball League in saves. So when they get a lead, they normally have success in maintaining that lead and converting it into a win. As Sierra off the end of the bat sends one into center field for a base knock with two outs in the third. So I guess the point is, if you're the Gateman right now having a 2 nothing lead, you have this team right where you want them in a sense. It's not a team that's going to explode for five, six, seven, nine runs at a given moment. It's a team that will get out to a lead and then kind of lull you to sleep with, I guess, fundamental baseball. Yeah, the saves thing is probably the most fascinating aspect of this team. They have 13 wins. In 12 of them, someone has recorded a save. They're led by Stephen Valines, who has six of them, but spreading the love around. Kisner now with two outs. A fastball pops the glove of ice. Strike one. Andre Frankenreiter has three, Kobe Johnson has one, and Wyatt Short has two. Normally a team that is last in so many categories, and I'll run through them again, run scored, RBIs, team ERA, even team strikeouts from this pitching staff, they don't have a good whip either. You wouldn't expect them to be in playoff contention. And in the Eastern Division, they may not be in playoff contention, but in the West, when... I guess teams are struggling a little bit more against the teams of the East. They're right in the thick of things. Could easily play themselves out of a playoff spot, though, because Katuit, which is in last place, only a half game behind these two teams. Larkins gets his signs, and now to the plate. Kisner sends one into left field, a base hit. Second time Kisner's been on, and second straight two-out single for Wareham. And now who comes up? Gavin Stepensky. A two RBI double back in the first inning and also a P down to second base to end the third inning, catching Logan Ice trying to steal on a wild pitch. On what would have been a wild pitch. His start, I guess, in limited action for the Gateman at all, reminiscent of Andrew Kalika's. Kalika came in, did have an 0-4, but then quickly started racking up hits in bunches and so far, certainly hasn't looked back. Kalika impressed in that first game, I believe it was in Hyannis, in which he made a spectacular catch deep in left center field. Stepensky has showcases all around talents today. RBI number three awaits on second base. Larkins knows that and chooses to pitch, pitch him backwards, offering a first pitch curveball for strike one. Stepensky plated both runners, the two runs of this game for the Gateman back in the first inning. 
Looking for more here in the bottom of the third. Larkins, one look on to second. Now to the plate, his 0-1. A fastball misses low and outside. Stepensky with two runs batted in in that first at bat. Here's a list of players who have two runs batted in or less on this roster. Charlie Warren, John Sternagel, Kramer Robertson, Connor Beck. All guys who have a lot more than one at bat. Yes. So Stepensky can make some friends like he hasn't already, but can make even more here in this at bat. Breaking ball bounced in front of ice. A good job dropping to his knees and blocking it. Of course, a lot of that is situational. Most of the guys I mentioned batting at the very top or at the very bottom of the order more often than not, and so not as many opportunities. The run batted in is an inherently flawed stat, but always good to have more of them than less of them. Larkin steps up off the mound and adjusts his jersey and hat. The Gateman offense trying to get more runs of support for their pitching staff that now has gone through two guys and is working on its third. Lark Larkins takes too long looking over at second and Stepensky will step out. Game officially an hour old now. First pitch at 7.03, now 8.03. It was moving along quickly until Zach Houston had to be taken out of the game. Grant Dyer had to warm up quickly. The 2-1 hit sharply into center field. J.B. Woodman charges back, and he'll be there to make the catch. Stepensky put good wood on it, but not this time as he leaves a pair stranded. To the fourth we go, 2-0 Gateman still on the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. A beautiful Wareham, Massachusetts at Spillane Field, the site of a battle between the Wareham Gateman and the Falmouth Commodores. A battle for third place. It was just announced on our PA system, and now we'll announce it on this broadcast. It's the 21st birthday of Megan O'Brien. Happy birthday, Megan, even though you cannot hear me right now. Not that she's announcing it or anything by wearing a tiara on her head that says 21st birthday, but yes, very happy birthday to Megan. I think the lone exception, when it's acceptable to do that, is your 21st yeah, birthday. Yeah, and it is your golden birthday as well, this That's being right. July 21st, so definitely a reason to celebrate. Megan won't be celebrating, though. Of course she, not. She'll be going home early and getting a good night's sleep. In bed by 10. Curfews are ever important to mm -hmm. the Wareham Gateman organization, yep. and rightfully so. Some tongue-in-cheek humor as we head to the top of the fourth inning. Grant well, Dyer pumps in a fastball that misses high. I high. abide by the curfew. I didn't think that was funny at all. We pushed it last night, mm -hmm. but off days. Got to have some fun, I guess. The trek up to Provincetown. <laughs> <laughs> Sharply hit, but Sternagel's right there. He fields it on a hop and one out quickly here in the top of the fourth. The Gateman had no hit the Falmouth Commodores through five innings earlier on this year. Now through three and a third without any hits. And the guy who had no hit them was Zach Houston, racking up, I want to say, nine or ten strikeouts in those only five innings. So very similar game in that facet. The Gateman with a 2 nothing lead in their pitching staff, though we've seen a lot of guys tow the rubber, has been excellent so far. Boomer White, one of Matt Crook's four strikeout victims, now digs in with one out. Dyer winds and delivers again over to Sternagel. Fields it on a short hop this time. Sternagel's been kept busy. Now third put out for him and second in a row. Should the impossible happen and the Gateman actually do finish off a no-hitter, they have a long ways to go, to be certain. But if that happens, do we include Zach Houston in the group no-hitter. He did pitch Ooh. in this game, but he did not retire a batter, so he did not contribute in the way that one would traditionally contribute to something like that. He'll be listed on point streak, that's for sure, so I think we have to. 
not like it's taxing on our part to include No, no, of course not. Ball one, missing outside, a fastball to Skaug. If one guy could end a no-hitter, probably will be Skaug or the guy on deck. And Skaug laces one into center, but Kalika on a hop. A great first step for the center fielder from UC Santa Barbara. Three up, three down. Dyer retires the side in order in the fourth. Bottom of the fourth, six, seven, and eight. Sternagle Sowers and Grand Prix do up for the Wareham Gateman. We've seen a total of five consecutive zeros put up by both teams since the Gateman struck for two on the bottom of the first, thanks to a double from Gavin Stepensky. Well, the Gateman pitching staff is now through four complete innings. They've faced the minimum and retired the minimum. They did allow a walk, so not perfect through four, but they have held the Commodores without a hit through four. That tops their most recent pitching performance in which they held the Katuit Cataliers hitless through three innings. They ran into trouble in the fourth, but here at Spillane, get through the fourth cleanly. So maybe a sign of good things to come in the future for this pitching staff. We'll see if they can continue their quest for a no-hitter. <laughs> Sternagel, who digs in and grounded out in his first at-bat, watches a first pitch breaking ball go by for ball one. The Gateman had a lead on Sunday, and though they saw it evaporate, has to feel good to have a two-run cushion in what looks to be a staff game today. Turner Larkins is the right-hander on the mound, starting his fourth inning of work. Has allowed a hit in every inning and a total of five so far. Sternagel bounces one over the diminutive fence over by the third base dugout. No one hurt, though, and another slew of kids racing towards it. Sternagel, before his ground out in the first, was five for his last ten. And coming into this game, has two multi-hit games in a row. Average above 200 now. The two and one pitch, lined into right field and down for a base hit. The Gateman continue to hit balls hard against Turner Larkins. Three out of four innings, their leadoff runner has reached on a single. And no strikeout so far for Larkins, and by extension the Gateman lineup. That's something that isn't entirely unexpected, but encouraging nonetheless, because that means that they're forcing the defense to make plays. So often early in the season when the Gatemen were winning games consistently, they were putting the ball in play and forcing the defense to make mistakes and make errors. That got more base runners and that got more runs. Larkins from the stretch now misses outside. Lavello gave a valiant effort there on a line drive that just sailed over his head. Sternagel will certainly take it, make that hit number six for the Gateman. One of those six hits came off the bat of Logan Sowers, sent a bouncing ball through the middle and into center field in his first at-bat. Fastball, and now ball two to the seven-hitter from Indiana. Sowers hits a similar ball here in this at-bat, may not get through because the middle infield is pinching a bit more towards the middle in hopes of turning a double play. Sternagel over on first base. The 2-0 from Larkin, swing and a miss. The count goes to 2-1. Our broadcast tonight, not in HD. The last time we had a home game, it was in HD. The difference, we have an extra camera tonight. So opportunity costs. Decipher that how you will. Sternagel takes off the pitch high and tight. Feet first slide. And Ice, his second caught stealing runner of the game. That was a close play at second from my perspective. It looked like Sternangle got his foot in there, but the call's the call, and now one down. Interesting to see there Sternangle going feet first instead of head first. I think it's safe to assume that head first slides get you to the bag quicker because there's less movement involved, and probably you don't slow down as much either. Also safer, though, safer, to go in correct. feet first. And that's probably the main factor in that. Playing summer league ball, you don't want to break a finger or jam a thumb. A lineup without Sternagel, which isn't going to be the case, but hypothetically would push Kisner over to third and then likely force McKinnon to take first, who's also banged up. 
Sowers aboard with now a one-out walk. Second time he's been on base tonight. Preston Grand Prix, who attempted to have a productive at-bat last time up, but then popped out on a bunt attempt to Blackman. Now gets a second stab at it. Larkins from the stretch, the first pitch of the at-bat. High and tight fastball. Grand Prix kind of stuck out his elbow. Yeah, pretty transparent too, I don't think. And then he gone to first. And then he looked right back at us in our camera here on the press box. Not no one saw that, anyone. did they? No, of course not. <laughs> Misjudging that breaking ball when it was heading towards his elbow. Larkins comes set and now to the plate. Paints a breaking ball again on the outside corner to even the count. Seven base runners now for the Gateman in this game. Two of them have come around to score. Sowers was caught stealing back in the second, so hence Larkins with the pickoff move to keep him close again. Gets his signs and now to the plate. Ground ball through the right side into right field for a base hit. Second hit of the inning and third straight runner for the Gateman to reach base. Grand Prix now one for two, and that brings up the nine-hitter, Kramer Robertson. Don't see anyone stirring in the Commodore's bullpen, but Larkins has now given up seven hits. Only two runs, both coming in the first inning, but he hasn't fooled anyone tonight, that's for sure. Make that hits in four or five games and a modest three-game hitting streak now for Preston Grand Prix. Baby steps. That's right. Keep in mind, too, that Grand Prix is a year younger than most of his opposition here in the Cape Cod Baseball League. And to put that in perspective, a freshman I was talking to before the game, and Andrew Snow, a guy who goes and plays second base at ASU, he's on this Falmouth Commodores team, started off his season 0 for his thir first 30-plus. Has two hits lately, but now he's 2 for 37. So Grand Prix to... Now have a batting average that's close to 190. Miles ahead of many of his freshman counterparts. It's all relative, though, because Evan Skaug is, or was a freshman last year as well, and he mashes the baseball seemingly against any pitching. Robertson went around strike one on a breaking ball that would have been ball one in the dirt. The Gatemen have reached all three hitters to come to the plate on base in this inning, but the one out was in the form of a Sternagel caught stealing. So it's Sowers on second and Grand Prix on first. Robertson up at the dish. Another ball bounced into ice. He drops to his knees with a good block. Kramer flew out to center field in his first at-bat. Now has a runner in scoring position and looking for an RBI. Has one of them this year, and this could potentially be number two if he sends one to the outfield. Larkins, though, comes in with a fastball on the outside portion. The count quickly one and two. A right-hander on right-hander matchup. Larkin stares in, agrees with his catcher ice. One look on to second. Now here he is to the plate. In on the fists of Robertson. He thought it could potentially be in fair territory, but instead it's back to the back, stop and foul. Lucky that didn't get his knuckles. That would have hurt. Yes, it would have. So Robertson stays alive. Does have a bit of life. Just fouled off a good offering from Larkins. We'll see what he has in store in this next pitch. Hmm. 
set at the letters, and here's his one-two pitch. Again, in on the fist of Robertson, but fortunately for him, foul. Robertson's now battled off two pitches on the inner portion of the plate. The question remains, will Larkin start changing his eye level and timing mechanisms at the plate and go towards the outside corner? Pitcher and catcher can't agree on anything, and that sends ice out to the mound. 2-0 Gateman here in the bottom of the fourth inning, threatening for more with two runners on base. Robertson, the nine hitter, up at the plate, trying to flip things over for the top portion of the order. That top portion has been pretty hot. Jabs is over two, but Kalika has hit two balls hard. Sierra has a hit. Kisner has a hit. And then Stepensky, who's not due up for a while but still constitutes the top portion of the order, has hit two balls hard and has two RBIs to show for it. Larkin's ahead, one and two. Two looks on to second. Now here he is to the plate. Robertson fists one over to third. Blackman bobbles it. He'll have to go to first. His throw is high. But Skaug maintains his foot on the bag or either tags Robertson there. Both runners will advance 90 feet thanks to the bobble from Blackman. Robertson lucky he didn't twist an ankle there. Pretty deft move to get his left foot in on the bag even as Skaug was jumping up and trying to tag him. But he's out. Now two down for Andrew Kalika. In many situations that would be considered an unproductive at bat. N not a no-out situation there, so advancing the runners may not do a whole lot of good, but when it puts two runners in scoring position for non-arguably the Gateman's best hitter right now, Andrew Kalika, he'll get the services of seeing a new pitcher, it looks like. Turner Larkins' day is done after three and two-thirds innings. He gave up two runs and is also responsible for the two runners on base. We'll tell you all about the new pitcher on the other side of this break. 2-0 Gateman and two runners aboard. They're threatening in the bottom of the fourth inning. Turner Larkins will give way to a relief pitcher, the first of the game for the Falmouth Commodores. It's the lefty, 6'3", 205, Bo Tucker from Georgia. Tucker has been pretty good out of the bullpen. ERA at 3.95, 0-1 on the year. Six earned runs in 13 and two-thirds innings. Six unearned runs, though, too, so he's one of the few guys on this pitching staff who has not had very good defense behind him. Eleven strikeouts in those 13 and two-thirds innings. Ten walks, though, and that's been his main weakness. Hailing from Rome, Georgia. Yes, that's the home of Will Muschamp and uh, Ellen L.A. Wilson, First <laughs> Lady of the United States in 1913 and 14. First wife of Woodrow Wilson. We normally don't talk extensively about the hometowns of players, but it's just funny because on our stat sheet, all it says is his hometown is Rome. Mm -hmm. Who knew it was Rome, Georgia, and not Rome, Rome? Well, we're not the only ones to make that connection. In 1929, Benito Mussolini <laughs> sent a statue of Romulus and Remus nursing from a mother wool to the city of Rome, Georgia. If you were to cite your sources, many would frown upon you because Wikipedia. you use Wikipedia. Something I do more frequently during my college broadcast because you don't typically see a, a player more than once. And Yeah, the hate on Wikipedia I think is kind of overblown, yeah. but I guess that's a subject for a different day. Tucker into the plate and Kalika into center field, a base hit. One run scores. Here comes Grand Prix. He's in. Kalika, his second hit of the ball game, and now 4-0 Gateman. At this point, we shouldn't even be surprised anymore when Andrew Kalika comes up with a clutch hit because he's been clutch every single game. It seems like every time the Gateman win a game, Kalika's a part of it. Kind of funny that Grand Prix it was the second runner to cross the plate there because... Before the game, I asked Grand Prix about Kalika. What are your thoughts on him? 
We know Kalika is a nice guy. Just wanted to get the impressions that his teammates had on him. Response from Grand Prix, he's just a winner. He loves doing what he does. He loves pumping up his team. The Gatemen coming into this game have lost 10 of 12. You wouldn't know it if you were to be around Andrew Kalika. Always upbeat, always positive. Super open to talk to us as well. Usually when you hear someone describe another person as a winner in the sports world, it's used to mask a lack of statistical evidence that he's a good player, but there's plenty of that for Kalika. The throw gets away from Skalgover at first and jabs will motor into second. Rather, Kalika, he's not stopping either. He's into third base. Cooper Ferris tells him to look over at the ball. He'll be content by staying on third. Jabs is at the plate, and the pickoff throw from Bo Tucker was airmailed. Skow didn't have a chance. So in the blink of an eye, Kalika goes first to third. Definitely an E1 there. Tucker's throw was not even close to Skow get first. Jabs is 0 for 2 today, a pop out and a ground out. Has Kalika on third trying to make this a 5-0 lead for the Gateman. Sends one high, back, and out of play. Jabs' is average probably a little bit lower than he would like it at 190 coming into the game, but as I've said when we've discussed his struggles, the evidence is there. We know what he can do when he's swinging the bat well. Bo Tucker winds and delivers, pulls the string on a breaking ball in the dirt and nicely stopped by ice. It's a shame that Andrew Snow isn't playing second base or shortstop tonight because then I would have gotten to say on two occasions when I scunned down runners, ice to snow. 2-2, two -two, fastball bounce in the dirt. The count runs full, Sierra on deck. That is a bummer. Or a relay throw from the outfield. We saw Lavello throw one in. Could have said snow to ice. Or... White to snow to ice, if there was a really, really bizarre Ooh, play. Ooh, yeah, that would be bizarre. That wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. There's a situation in which that would happen. Will we have time for it? Yes, as Jabs hits one foul. If a ball sails over the head of Boomer White, that calls for a double cut, which means the shortstop goes out. He's the primary uh, cutoff man. But if the throw from the outfielder sails over his head, the second baseman's duty is to be r right behind him. So it would be white, air mails his shortstop, and into snow. And then I don't know how there would be a play at the plate and all that, but hopefully to ice as well. It reminded me of something I saw on Twitter today. People talking, of course, the MLB trade deadline is fast approaching. And Correct. Talks of Mike Fires going to the Toronto Blue Jays, home of Justin Smoke. So I guess ah. you could say that where there's smoke, there could be fires. I love it. Yeah. Except Justin Smoke doesn't play too often. Actually, this season he's getting more playing time, probably than he should, but I want to say average around 230. The payoff pitch to Jabs, breaking ball that misses high and tight. Jabs stares at it, and he's aboard first base. Sierra to the plate with a first and third situation. Mound Conference here looks like the pitching coach. We'll see if this necessitates another call to the bullpen. Does my memory serve correctly? The first pitch Kalika saw he sent into center field? Correct. So Bo Tucker came on in relief of Turner Larkins. Two runs that won't be attributed to his mark, but two inherited runners. On the first pitch he throws to Kalika, serves up an RBI single, and he just walked jabs. So hasn't been effective up to this point, coming into this fourth inning with two outs and having yet to retire a batter. Since we have a little time, we'll take a look around the league. Two games have gone final. YD Red Sox in Brewster beat the Whitecaps 7-0. Chatham Anglers in Katuit beat the Kettleers 7-2. That game of relevance to both of these teams playing tonight. That'll help the winner of this game and I guess the loser too. At McKeon Park, the Harbor Hawks leading the Bourne Braves by a score of 7-5 in the top of the eighth. 
And in the top of the eighth at White House Field, the Firebirds lead the Mariners 2-1. to one. Breaking ball to Sierra. That catches the inside corner 0-1. So the loser of this game will not drop down to last place in the Western Division. Ketteliers coming in a half game behind both of these teams who have an identical record at 13-19-1. and one. Hyannis in first place in the division, four games up at 17-15-1. Bournes occupied that second spot for a while at 15-16-2. Runner takes off, jabs into second. He's hosed by Logan Ice. Third caught stealing of the game. Cooper Ferris does not agree. Jabs doesn't either. Looked like he may have gotten in under the tag. That's not for us to dispute, though. Three out here in the fourth, but two runs across the plate on an Andrew Kalika single. 4 nothing Gateman as we head to the top of the fifth on the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. Through four complete innings here at Spillane Field, the Gatemen have a 4 nothing lead over the Commodores. Jake Garcia, Eric Bramer, and Megan O'Brien on hand to deliver you a matchup and a contest for two teams battling for third place in the West. So far, it's been all Gatemen, and that fourth inning took so long. We'll remind you again that this pitching staff still has not given up a hit. It was a staff that got things started with Matt Crook on the mound. He delivered two excellent innings, striking out four. Then Zach Houston came in, faced a batter, walked him, threw two balls to Shane Bennis, and was promptly removed due to an injury. It's been the Grant Dyer show ever since, retiring the side in order in the third inning and then once again in the fourth. Also, despite it being 4-0, the player of the game on the Falmouth side of things has definitely been the catcher Logan Ice as the four-hitter J.J. Matajevic sends one foul. Kalika stole a base on what was the second batter of the game, and since then, Ice has gunned down three runners. Matajevic, who bounced out to Kisner his first at-bat, is up at the plate. Ten-game hitting streak coming into this game, takes a healthy hack and comes up empty. 18 for his last 42 is Matajevic. That's pretty good. That's an average over the past two weeks of over 430. Dyer has him down quickly in an 0-2 count. Matajevic stays alive and hits one foul. And you might have seen Stepensky, the catcher, take almost a mid-air hop as the pitch was being delivered and set up outside. It's clear that they didn't want to give anything middle in to Matajevic. Dyer winds and delivers the 0-2. Matajevic hits one sharply and off the brick wall over there down the third base side. Dyer's been pumping away, 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 talking with the Falmouth broadcasters before the game. They said that that was the biggest transformation for Matajevic, who's boosted his average 100 points recently. He started working more away and has a ton of hits to show for it. Dyer probably confused everyone there. Stepensky looked like he was fooled. Breaking ball misses inside. And so Matajevic has been pestering the left side of the field with base, base hits, and then that's caused pitchers to start coming more inside, which he then is killed for extra bases. Comes up empty, though, on a breaking ball, requiring a throw from Stepensky. It's accurate. A quick out here on the top of the fifth. Strikeout number six for the pitching staff. Crook had four and two innings, and now the second for Dyer. Dyer definitely qualifies as a strikeout artist. And why not boost the stats with the 4 0 lead? Matajevic frustrated with the helmet off, taking his time getting back to the dugout. Very good breaking ball there from Dyer. Pulls the string sharply, and Blackman comes up empty. Blackman playing third base. We've seen him have conversations with Cooper Ferris quite frequently in these now five matchups between these two teams. Ferris, a former coach at a community college in Mississippi. Blackman goes to Ole Miss, so the two of them have some sort of connection. Down quickly to Dyer, 0-2. Stepensky sets up outside. Dyer hits his spot, but too far off the plate. Dyer from the windup, his one and two pitch in the dirt, strike three. Dyer with back-to-back -back strikeouts, now a total of three in his outing. 
And we are now more than halfway to a no-hitter. We had a conversation with a fellow Katuit fan. And it seems quite frequently we ha we've had these conversations with a ton of people asking whether or not we thought it was journalistically ethical to mention a no-hitter. I think it's without question that it's journalistically ethical. Mm -hmm. Is it the unwritten rules of baseball ethical? I guess that's the subject of debate, but we don't really worry about that. No. We tell it how it is. For those just joining us, the Gateman pitching staff is working on a combined no-hitter. Dyer pumps in strike two quickly to Woodman. Woodman was a strikeout victim back in the second inning. Dyer trying to retire him for the second time tonight. Pumps a fastball, missing just outside one and two. The windup and the delivery into the plate. Strike three, Bayou. Another curveball for Grant Dyer. He strikes out the side here in the fifth. Gateman with a 4 nothing lead on the Cape Cod Baseball League Network and WCTV. 4-0 Gateman at Spillane Field. As we head to the bottom of the fifth inning, 3, 4, and 5 due up for the Gateman. Tuesday night baseball on WCTV and the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. Saw some shots of the crowd here at Spillane. The last game, the last home game the Gateman had was their first of the season with an attendance over 1,000. And it was their first walk-off of the year. Indeed it was. It was a very exciting game. People camping out in the back of pickup trucks, possibly. Nick Sieri do up. He's one for two. Singled in his last at-bat. The Gatemen have had hits in every single inning so far. Two in the first, one in the second, two in the third, and three in the bottom of the fourth. Sierra gets plunked high and tight, stared sharply at the Gateman dugout, and then will saunter on to first. But no looks back at the pitcher, Bo Tucker, and that's what you're supposed to do when you're hit by a pitch that is presumably accidental. In that walk-off win for the Gateman, Austin Hayes was three for three and came to the plate against Evan Hill. Then got plunked. Benches cleared. The Gateman bullpen came down and had a few words as well. No punches were thrown, fortunately. But Austin Hayes did not react well to a pitch that looked to just have gotten away from Hill. No harm, no foul. Sierra acts properly. Yeah, and I'm never one for the benches clearing. I think it's quite unnecessary. But the Cape League is, I guess, sort of criticized for... The players being all about me and not about the team. And that's inherent. I mean, you've got players coming together and playing on a team that they have no investment in. Any investment that they do have is a plus, and that should be encouraged. Yeah, and I have no problem with that. But I don't know if it's the worst, I guess, PR for the league when bench is clear. That shows that teams are into the game. They're backing their teammates. They have passion for the organization they represent. I think what happened was exactly where you want to tread the line. You right. don't want any physical violence, but you want to see passion, and we definitely saw passion Saturday night. Kisner quickly ahead, 2-1, and one, and here he skies one in the infield. Routine for whoever it's going to be. It will be the pitcher, Bo Tucker. Probably not what head coach Jeff Trundy wants to see, but an out nonetheless. Yeah, it's easy to say that he should be called off there, but that was right at him. So, an easy out, and that'll bring up Stepensky. And I have to reiterate that in no circumstance will I ever applaud benches clearing or pitches intentionally being thrown at hitters, which, to our knowledge, Hills was not. But I do think it showed a level of investment from these players in their respective teams. Stepensky, who has been incredibly hot at the plate today, watches ball one high and tight. And whether it was a byproduct or a direct product, the Gateman did seem to get fired up after that and eventually won the game. Tucker to the plate, pumps a fastball. Stepensky comes up empty. 
Stepensky had the big blow in the bottom of the first, a two-out, two-RBI double, and then laced one into center field in the third, but right at J.B. Woodman. So comes into this at-bat, one for two with two RBIs. Sierra over on first. He was hit by a pitch to start this inning. Bo Tucker from the stretch. Fastball misses low. Tucker set now to the plate. And the same exact thing. A fastball misses low. carbon copy of the pitch he threw right before that but now for Stepensky has a three and one count hitters advantage Sternagel on deck Tucker to the plate bounced in front of Logan Ice behind the plate now two base runners as Stepensky's aboard with a one out walk Bo Tucker came on in the fourth inning, quickly allowed two RBIs from Andrew Kalika to come home and score on a single, then walked a batter, was bailed out by Logan Ice, who then threw out Jay Jabs, who was trying to steal. But Bo Tucker hasn't been fooling anyone on the mound, hit Sierra, got Kisner to pop out, but then just walks to Penske. That'll be the end of his night. We'll see the third pitcher of the game for the Commodores, and we'll tell you all about him in-depth scouting report on the other side of this break. Two runners aboard the Gateman trying to extend their lead to more than four runs in the bottom of the fifth inning. Bo Tucker gives way to the third relief pitcher for the Falmouth Commodores. Now it's the right-hander Jack Finnegan. And interestingly enough, not out of a four-year university, but out of McClellan Community College. He may be transferring next year, who knows. But coming into this game, 2-1 and one with a 4.02 ERA. So for the most part, looks like He's held his own, more strikeouts than innings pitch, 16 compared to 15.2, but seven walks and seven earned runs this season. We would imagine that at McLennan he had a great deal of success, which is why he's out here. Looks like he throws pretty hard from the right side. 6'2", 175. This will be his eighth relief appearance of the year. Kind of a tricky one, too, and a similar one to what Bo Tucker inherited. Tucker coming on with two runners aboard, two runners in scoring position. Here in the bottom of the fifth, only one in scoring position, but Stepensky over on first as well. The hitter is John Sternagel, who's one for two, grounded out and singled. The sun has officially set at Spillane Field. Temperature dropping, but still a great night. Made even better for the Gatemen because they're up 4-0 and threatening for more with one out in the bottom of the fifth. Finnegan set and now to the plate. Pumps in a first pitch fastball for a strike. fire that's completely unnecessary tonight but I guess keeping the bug bugs away it serves a purpose of repellent rather than warmth the 0 and one pitch is a breaking ball that misses high to even the count One and one count to John Sternagel, the third baseman from Florida. Then again, a look on to second, now to home plate. Bouncing ball, third base over to Blackman. He's on to second for one, and on to first, a double play to end the bottom of the fifth. The Gateman had two runners on, but that's quickly a race as Sternagel grounds into an inning-ending double play. As we head to the sixth inning, it's 4-0 Gateman on the Cape Cod Baseball League Network and WCTV. Motivation has not been an issue for the Gateman tonight. They lead 4-0 as we head to the sixth inning. Hasn't been an issue for Grant Dyer either. He's been lights out ever since coming on in the third inning. Now a total of four strikeouts 
in just over two innings of work. Struck out the side he forgot in the about fifth me. inning, and the Skateman pitching staff still working on a combined no-hitter. They'll have to tread through the bottom of the Commodore lineup, 7, 8, and 9, Logan Ice, Shane Bennis, and Nick Lavello. Ice was the only member of this Commodore's team to have reached base so far. Drew a leadoff walk in the third inning and then was promptly cut down trying to steal second base. Two runs in the first for the Gateman, two runs in the fourth. On each time they came on one swing of the bat. Stepensky an RBI, two RBI double, Kalika two RBI single. Strike one to Logan Ice, a fastball in the inside corner. Ice comes up empty, and it's quickly 0-2. Dyer shakes off his catcher and now delivers a breaking ball. Ball one. Looked like that may have hit Stepensky and the home plate umpire giving him some time. One and two to the seven hitter, Logan Ice. Dyer winds and delivers a fastball, misses outside, even the count at two. Dyer shakes off his catcher, now to the plate, strike three on a fastball, fourth straight strikeout for Grant Dyer. Dyer definitely pitching well. He came in with a runner on in the third inning and has not allowed a base runner since. Not sure how long he's going to go, though. That's the thing. Doesn't look like anyone's warming up in the bullpen. Dyer's 1-2. On the inside corner, strike three. Make that five strikeouts in a row now for Grant Dyer. When he's on, he's been on for this Gateman team. Now is matched a season high with six. And if you're of the mind that this Falmouth Commodores team is very similar in their strengths and weaknesses as this Wareham Gateman squad, we've seen the Gateman in this position before. Getting down early and just unable to put hits together course the Commodores right now with no hits at all but it's hard to feel confident in your ability to get back in the game when you don't have someone who can hit the ball out of the ballpark I believe I was just flashed a paper that said 37 pitches for Grant Dyer 28 strikes pretty so good he has peppered the strike zone tonight and has six strikeouts to show for it Lavello will not be struck out instead he chops one over the glove of Sternagel and he's aboard. We'll be seeing, see how that's ruled. It could be the first hit of the game for the Commodores. I'm inclined to give that an error, but it looks like it's going to be a hit. It's a shame to see the no-hitter end on something that's iffy like that. But for the time being, at least, it looks like it's going to be an infield base hit. Lavello aboard. Still no ball has left the infield successfully in this game. And in total, only two of them have even left. Two flyouts now. Dyer has to work out of the stretch. The leadoff man, Caleb Hamilton, has to dance out of the way of a fastball. Hamilton comes set. His 1 0 offering. This time a successful fastball, one and one. We do not have replay capabilities, but I'd like to see that one after the game. That's a very tough call to call it a hit or an error. Hot 
Strike two now, Grant Dyer. Now quickly ahead of Hamilton. Lavello over on first for the time being. That's the first hit of the game for the Commodores. Dyer set now to the plate. Fastball in on the fist. And Hamilton stays alive, hits one foul. Grant Dyer struck out the side in the fifth, has two strikeouts here in the sixth, looking for strikeout number three of this inning. The one-two curveball by you. Dyer now at seven strikeouts and second straight inning for him in which he struck out the side. Bottom of the sixth, Gateman 4 nothing over the Commodores. Back out at Spillane Field, 4 nothing Gateman over the Commodores. Jake Garcia, Eric Bramer, Megan O'Brien, and a bunch of fans and our friends in the stands witnessing a four-run lead for the Gateman. Seven, eight, and then nine due up for them in the bottom of the sixth inning. Sowers takes ball one, high and outside. Finnegan still on the mound for the Commodores. He came on with one out in the fifth inning with two runners on and quickly induced a double play to end the inning from Sternagel. Now 2-0 and as a fastball misses outside. Finnegan into his windup and now into the plate. Just misses ball three. The eight hitter Grand Prix awaits. The bottom of the fifth was the first time in this game in which the Gatemen were held hitless in an inning. Taking all the way is Sowers. He watches strike one go by all over the plate. Eight hits for the Gatemen, four runs to show for it. One hit, no runs for the Commodores. Sowers swings and misses, the count full. Finnegan drops his hands, now to the plate, breaking ball. He lost it. Sowers on base, draws a walk. Third time Sowers has been on base tonight. Things starting to look up for Sowers. And at the right time, too. Should this team make the playoffs, and if the season ended today, they would. They would like to have Sowers' bat functioning at 100%. And on a selfish level as well, Sowers competing in the home run derby. Wasn't named an all-star, but we've seen the light tower power he has in batting practice. So a good site and a good venue for him to showcase his talents. Grand Prix shows bunt and then pulls back. You say light tower power, you mean that because at Fenway he actually hit the light tower over the green monster in left field. That's right. Seems like even his misses here in batting practice find their way over the left field fence. The ball gets past ice behind the plate, possibly distracting him. It was Grand Prix who was showing bunt. Sowers into second. That'll be a wild pitch. Grand Prix, one for two. I doubt his purpose at the plate changes right now with the runner on second. If he lays down a good bunt, Sowers will be on third with one out. No one really creeping in all that much. First and third base playing at the corners. Here they do as Grand Prix shows bunt and then takes back. Cooper Ferris looks away over at third base, obviously discontent. Looked like they were going to try for the out at third because the third baseman, Tate Blackman, was not going in. He was covering the bag. It was Skaug at first charging in, and then Finnegan presumably asked to take the left side of the infield. Finnegan has two-thirds, the center portion and the third base line. Here he is to the plate. Grand Prix shows bunt. It's a good one. Right side, Finnegan on to first, a low throw, but the second baseman, Lavello, is able to stab it. A good bunt there from Grand Prix. Unsuccessful in his attempt in the second, but successful there. Sowers on to third. The 
Now Robertson, who had an RBI opportunity in the fourth inning, did not cash through as he grounded out to third base, but here it doesn't even take a base hit. Just a ball to the outfield will likely score Sowers. Infield playing at the cut of the grass. First pitch is a breaking ball that doesn't break. Ball one. Robinson, or rather Robertson, 0 for 2. And now has a few words with his third base coach. Don't rule out the possibility of a suicide squeeze. Sowers at third, not exactly John Sternagel speed-wise, but can hold his own if he's asked to head down the line. Sternagel was the man who crossed the plate in the Gateman's walk-off suicide squeeze the other night. Grand Prix was the benefactor of a base hit and an RBI in that situation. He just laid down a good bunt right before Robertson. We'll see if the same message is applied to Robertson here on the 1-0 count. Finnegan to the plate, and Robertson does not show bunt. Instead, takes ball two. Keep in mind, though, that there's still only one out. and You don't necessarily want to make an out at home plate if you have two chances, especially with Kalika on deck. Softly hit and highly chopped over the second baseman, Lavello into right field. Robertson with an RBI single and now a five-run lead for the Gateman. That's the tough part about playing percentages if you're the Commodores. If your infield is playing at normal defense, that's a routine out. But chopped over and an RBI single instead, it's now 5 nothing. That wasn't sharply hit, but like you said, Robertson is the benefactor of a drawn-in infield. RBI number two for him on the 2015 season. Now it's Kalika who has two RBIs of his own and four in the last two games. He's two for three, hit the ball sharply all three times. And wouldn't you know it, Finnegan, instead of coming hard, throws soft stuff, gets a first pitch strike on a breaking ball. Still only one out here in the sixth inning. So the Gateman very much alive to produce another rally. Finnegan pickoff move on to first, a good one, but Robertson back safely with the head first slide. Finnegan sat at the belt, lifts his leg and on to home plate, wrapped sharply first base side but foul. Over towards the Gateman bullpen, where the fire is still alive and well. Count 0-2 to Kalika, who we've seen time and time again this season, doesn't seem to be phased with hitting with two strikes. Finnegan's offering on the outside corner a fastball, and strike three, Kalika down looking. That is the first time that the Commodore's pitching staff has struck out a member of the Gateman lineup. Compare that to Grant Dyer, who alone in his now three-plus innings of work has struck out eight batters. Including striking out the side the last two innings. I'm excuse me, make that seven batters then. Seven plus four for Crook. So 11 strikeouts for this Gateman pitching staff. One and zero to the two hitter Jay Jabs. Walked and then 0 for two. Aside from that, Robertson takes a big secondary. Not going though, and Jabs now ahead two and zero. Strike there on the outside corner. Five zero Gateman here in the bottom of the sixth inning with two outs. Two and one offering is low and in the dirt. 
Count goes to three and one. Finnegan set. Here's his three and one pitch. Chopped. Lavello's way again. He fields it cleanly and on to first for out number three. The Gatemen get another run thanks to an RBI single from Kramer Robertson. 5 0 and on to the seventh inning at Spillane Field on the Cape Cod Baseball League Network and WCTV. Two, three, and four. Top of the order for the Falmouth Commodores. They'll try and muster up any semblance of a heartbeat against Grant Dyer. Dyer came in in the third with only one out and then was promptly extremely effective from there. He's had quite a few strikeouts now, a total of seven of them in this game. First pitch, or rather second pitch, to Boomer White. Chopped foul, 0-2. And a reminder that even though no history will take place tonight, the Gatemen have not allowed a hit out of the infield. The only hit coming in the last inning off the glove of John Sternagel at third, an infield single. White, Skaug, and Matajevic do up this inning. The 0-2 pitch, White stays alive and fouls one back. If the Gateman can hold on and not allow another hit in this game, it would be their second one-hit performance in the past couple weeks, both of them coming here at Splane Field, the other one against the Kettleers. 0-2 pitch from Dyer, tomahawked over to Grand Prix at short. His throw sails wide of Kisner over at first. Score that E6, E6 White's aboard here on the top of the seventh. It would have been a close play, but Grand Prix would have gotten him if that throw was on target. But the Gateman can take solace in knowing that Dyer's on the mound, he's been good, and it'll take a lot of hits for this Commodore's offense to get back in this game. Second base runner Dyer is allowed. Now he navigates through the tough portion of the order. Skaug, who's 0 for 2, but always dangerous in the left-handed batter's box. Stepensky lines up a bit outside. Dyer throws more towards the heart of the plate, but too low. Dyer set and delivers a called strike. A good fastball there on the inside portion. Count one and one. Now 2-1 and one is an off-speed pitch. Misses low. The Gateman this season, 0-5 on Tuesdays following an off day on Monday. So each time in which they've gotten some time to recover, the results have not been there. And while I have ridiculed you for the record on the That's a good one. That's, that's got to be a good week, one. Yes, it does potentially have an impact to lose games coming off of an off day. I could frame that by just saying the Gateman 0-5 on Tuesdays, but instead I framed it mm -hmm. as after an off day on Monday, the Gateman are 0-5. And, and your argu argument is better off for it. We asked Cooper Ferris about that before the game, and he gave sort of a nonchalant answer, just I don't know what they do with their off days. That's not really my control. I don't know if he wants to know. But, I mean, even if they behaved as they were mandated to do so, as Scow comes up empty on a breaking ball, White 90 feet into second base, Dyer continues to strike out batters in bunches, out number one here in the seventh. Even if the players did rest up on the off days, it's still a day away from baseball mm -hmm. and a day away from live pitching. And keep in mind, all these players are college athletes too, and so they're used to playing baseball part of the time and having schoolwork and all these other things to take up their time. So to be all baseball all the time out here, as many of them are, is definitely an adjustment. 
Matajevic, who has been quiet in this game, surprisingly quiet. 0 for 2, remember, he's riding a 10-game hitting streak coming into this game. If he can deposit one into the outfield and into some open grass, he could plate the first run of the game for the Commodores. I think I overheard correctly that that is being called a passed ball. You've been an official scorer once. Mm -hmm. You're a big boy. Make that call for yourself. No, I, I defer tonight. Dyer from the set and now to the plate. Just missing there with the changeup. Matajevic leads this team in average home runs and RBIs. 11 RBIs this season, and seven of them have come in his 10-game hitting streak. Has one on the pond and Boomer White on second base. We'll see if he can cash him in. Stepensky out to the mound on a hop. <laughs> Dyer now set and we're ready to do things with a 1 and 0 cap. Fastball on the outside corner and past the swinging bat of Matajevic. <coughs> Grand Prix at short, giving signs to his pitcher, Dyer. Going over potential daylight plays, pickoff moves. I know you get tired of me saying this, but the guys of focus right now, all Pac-12. UCLA on the mound, U of A in the batter's box, and Grand Prix, who you just mentioned, over at Cal. I don't mind that. I just, you know, I expect <laughs> the same respect when I talk about my Big Ten guys. Of course. It happens with much less frequency. See Big Ben Anchef down in the bullpen. Sub subject of a very nice story by Zane Moses. Got some national media attention. Dyer's one and two pitch up the middle and into center field. Boomer White was backtracking on the play, thinking it could be caught. It's, I guess, in principle, good base running, but because no one was really there, probably not heads up on his part to not be running on that. Matajevic extends his hitting streak to 11 games. To be fair, it fooled me a little bit, too. I don't think anyone expected that ball to be hit as lightly as it did. must have been off the end of the bat. But nonetheless, Matajevic with the first hit to the outfield for the Commodores, and now we can stop dwelling on that hit in the sixth inning that broke up the no-hitter. If Blackman's able to come through here with one out, the run would not be earned because Boomer White reached on an air from Preston Grand Prix. Dyer pours in a fastball, strike one. Blackman 0 for 2, a looking strikeout, and then a swinging strikeout in the fifth. Runner goes early. Dyer steps off, throw into second base where Robertson is waiting, and miraculously, they got him. A no-look tag from Robertson. That's bizarre. It's not bizarre that Matajevic left early. You see that quite frequently. It's bizarre, though, that... Dyer was able to deliver an accurate throw after seemingly being flustered on the mound. Robertson was surely flustered over at second. Just right place, right time, and the ball found his glove, and the glove found the sliding runner. One four in the scorebook, and now Dyer hopes to get out of it. Now 0-2 against Blackman. Dyer comes set, and here's his 0-2 pitch, a curveball in the dirt, and strike three. Blackman's gone down swinging three times now in this game. Strikeout number nine for Grant Dyer. Bottom of the seventh, time to stretch here at Spillane, the home team with a 5-0 lead. Welcome back to Spillane Field. The Gateman with a 5-0 lead in the bottom of the seventh inning. 
Jake Garcia, Eric Bramer, Megan O'Brien, and now Joseph Camacho, the new pitcher, into the game for the Falmouth Commodores on in relief of Jack Finnegan, who gave up a run in the six. Camacho was pretty much the main starter for the Alabama State team. They used him quite a bit, and he was 12-0 and on the year, 3.84 ERA. 84 and a third innings pitched, only 36 earned runs, 76 strikeouts to 20 walks. He's the new pitcher in this game, Mitch Longo, the new left fielder, taking the place of Boomer White. See here he takes ball one outside. Did you know the Bama State mascot? No, I don't. It is the Hornets, perhaps? Yep, the Hornets. The abbreviation is ASU. Yep, go Devils. Sierra fouls one off the count now one and one on the day. Sierra one for two, been on base twice though, hit by a pitch in his last plate appearance. Camacho spins one in and Sierra laces one into center field. Two hit night for Nick Sierra. He's aboard to lead off the bottom of the seventh. And a hit to right center too. Not something that we've seen very frequently, but that wasn't a fastball either. Fourth hit of the season for Nick Sierra to his pole side. Can thank the spray charts on Point Streak for those beautiful analysis and allowing us to talk about these types of things on the broadcast. Kisner will now dig in. He's one for two, reach base twice, once with a walk, once with a single. Camacho slings one in, about a 65% release. Not officially three quarters, not exactly a sidewinder, but a right-handed sling man. Camacho from the stretch. Frisbee slider there had a lot of movement on it. Kisner looked like he was taking from the beginning 0-2. Five zero Gateman here in the bottom of the seventh inning. Two runs in the first, two runs in the fourth, and one run in the sixth. Another slider there. This time Kisner alertly fouls it back and out of play. Nine hits for the Gateman. Only in one inning, which was the fifth, did they not get a hit. Meanwhile, only two hits for the Commodores. And before the sixth inning, they had been held hitless. In on the fist of Kisner, he fouls it back. The Gateman pitching staff working on a combined shutout. Matt Crook started the game, went two innings. Zach Houston faced a batter and threw two balls to the second batter, then departed. It's been the Grant Dyer show ever since. Nine strikeouts. He's only allowed one runner to even reach scoring position, and that came on an air from Preston Grand Prix. Kisner down a no two hole. Camacho to the plate. Softly tapped to Blackman. On to second for one. The throw to first, not in time. Kisner on with a fielder's choice. Sierra wiped out at second. Sierra now one for three. Stepensky to the plate, who's one for two. Had his first hit in a Gateman uniform. It was a big one in the first inning. Two out, two RBI double. And if he can hit for extra bases, it'll be much needed for this Gateman team, a team that struggles to hit for extra bases. And now he's aboard for the third time second hit as he shoots one into right field. A one-out base knock. Runners now on first and second. His second hit the third time, he's hit the ball on the screws, too. Only time he was retired was back in the third inning when he hit a drive deep to left center field going oppo. The Gateman threatening again here in the seventh inning. Trying to push their lead to even more than five runs off the new relief pitcher, Joseph Camacho. Think we go Stepensky or Kalika for player of the game? Still with six outs, or rather five outs, the Gateman have to make at the plate before we can officially determine. But Kalika and Stepensky, both very deserving of the honor. It probably will be up to you. 
it will be. I'm the color guy, so I'll be interviewing, although Megan O'Brien probably gets first dibs on it. That's right. I forgot about that. Usually, And I especially since it's her birthday, yep. we have to yep. seed rights. I'm tempted to go Grant Dyer myself. But. Ooh, yes. I. How could I forget about Grant Dyer? Strikeout artist of nine batters. Probably in line for the win tonight. Crook, the starter, we knew he was not going to go the required five innings, and Houston was ineffective in the one-and-a-half batters he faced. They count quickly 0-2 to John Sternagel. One for three, grounded out in a double play in his last time up. A similar ground ball here would end this seventh inning, but Sternagel, of course, has other thoughts, looking for his second hit of the game. Camacho, two looks on to second, now to the plate, slider, that causes Logan Ice to leave his crouch and flail a slide that he successfully executes. Pretty good lateral movement there by Ice. He ended up towards the outer chalk of the left-handed batter's box. Kisner on second, Stepensky on first. Sternagel down on a one and two count. Camacho to the plate. Fastball probably that had the movement of a slider misses low and outside ball two. Camacho's two and two offering. He got Sternagel down on strikes. Two outs now here in the bottom of the seventh and Logan Sowers to the play. Logan Sowers who is not been retired on three occasions. One for one with two walks and two runs scored. Yeah, good day for him and can make it even better with a base, base hit to the outfield here. Sowers has put together back-to-back -to -back solid performances regardless of what happens in this at-bat. Still, though, looking for the cherry on top. Takes a first pitch breaking ball. Oh and one is the count to the seven hitter left fielder. Camacho set near the eardrums, slings another pitch into home plate and induces a swing and miss. Oh and two count to Sowers. Two outs and two runners aboard. Double take on to second base from Camacho. One and two. Comes set. His one and two offering is on the outside corner. Strike three. Camacho gets out of the jam by inducing two strikeouts here in the bottom of the seventh. And the Gatemen leave a pair. 4-0, or rather 5-0 as we head to the eighth. Eighth inning at Spillane Field. Jake Garcia, Eric Bramer, and Megan O'Brien. 5-0 Gateman out in front of the Commodores, this pitching staff, and it's really been a staff effort tonight, still working on a shutout. The no-hitter is gone, the no-hitter that lasted five complete innings, erased on a single from Lavello in the sixth, and then another single from Matajevic in the seventh. But I guess small victories, and maybe it wouldn't even be a small one, a shutout very much a possibility. And Grant Dyer out to begin his sixth inning of work. I'm a bit surprised to see that. A setup man at UCLA, but obviously has been very effective tonight. He's had one start this season for the Wareham Gateman team. In that start, came against Katuit, went four innings, allowed four hits and one earned run. Was effective, though. Not a start tonight, but the makings of a start. Extremely long relief for the right hander. Pours in a strike, first pitch to J.B. Woodman, 0 for 2 with a pair of strikeouts. Woodman comes up empty here, the count quickly 0 and 2. Dyer strikes out Woodman, that would 
I mean, the second straight batter in which he's caused an 0 for 3 with three strikeout day at the plate. 0 2, misses low. A curveball there from Dyer count 1 and 2. Both these teams looking for win number 14 on the Cape League season. The winner has sole possession of third place. It is gone official, too. The Harbor Hawks beat the Braves. So the Braves remain at 32 points. The winner of this game, if it's the Gateman, they will get 29 points. So be one and a half games back of the Braves and one and a half ahead of the Kettleers. Fastball on the inside corner. Dyer got Woodman looking. Now Blackman and Woodman are both 0 for 3 with three strikeouts. Dyer, 10. 10 strikeouts. That's absurd. In relief, too. He's been pretty good. It's gotten to the point where I'm having to write the number beside the strikeout because I can't count all these strikeouts that Dyer has notched. A total of 14 for this staff because don't forget, Crook struck out four in his two innings of work. Ball one misses low to Ice, who, you guessed it, was a strikeout victim. And in fact, everyone, aside from the nine-hitter Lavello, has struck out. This ball is sent foul and out of play. Dyer came into this game with 13 strikeouts in 11 and a third innings. But he's shown flashes of this. Two outings ago at Hyannis on July 10th, he struck out six and two and a thirds. We remember that one. And he has swing and miss stuff, to be certain. Going a little bit before that, against Orleans, the best hitting team in the Cape League, on July 5th, three innings, five strikeouts. So starting to rack up the punch outs in bunches. Two and one, misses outside, three and one. Bennis, who's 0 for 2 with two strikeouts, is on the on deck circle. Dyer winds and delivers his 3-1 pitch. Hit foul. Count runs full. There has not been a put out by a Gateman fielder since the fourth inning. Dyer struck out the side in the fifth, <laughs> struck out the side in the sixth, struck out two in the seventh, and the other out came and he caught stealing. And it was of Dyer's doing, too. Yes. He didn't even throw the ball to the plate. So Dyer's pretty much gotten every single out since the fourth inning. Not pretty much, he has. I think he has to be the player of the game He has today. to be the player of the game. I take back my unfair comments. Kalik and Stepensky will be sad, but I think they'd see to their pitcher as well. The 3-2 pitch in on the fist, ice fouls it back. The payoff pitch, Dyer comes set to the plate. This ball is sent over to Sowers, who ventures towards the line, puts it away for out number two. Wow. That's a, that's a shame. You know why? I was hoping with all my might, and I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to anyway, there'd be a strikeout looking because then ice would have been frozen. Ah. Shucks. Well, we play him one more time, so you might have your chance. Now that, but now that just it loses all the pizzazz and the flavor because mm -hmm. you know it's coming. Oh well. Shane Bennis, 0 for 2, two strikeouts as I mentioned, takes strike one, a breaking ball. Dyer's 0 and 1 pitch to the nine hitter, or rather the eight hitter. Lavello's the nine hitter on deck. One and one, a fastball there, missing low and inside. Dyer looking for a tidy one, two, three inning. Pumps a fastball high. Bennis comes up empty. Come on, 
1-2 pitch from Grant Dyer. Bennis barely stays alive. Taps the ball off the shin protector of Stepensky. Dyer strikes out Bennis. It'll be the third hitter in which he struck out and caused that hitter to go for to go 2 0 for 3 with three strikeouts. Two guys with the hat trick already. Dyer trying to make it guy number three. Staying alive, Bennis will reset, do things again, one and two. We will see if Dyer comes out for the ninth inning to end this game, but if this is his last batter, he has been absolutely dominant. Wines and delivers on the outside corner, but for a ball, two and two. Robertson, the second baseman, started heading on into the dugout. Two's across the board in the top of the eighth inning. Dyer's breaking ball doesn't break very much. Bennis gets plunked. He's aboard with two outs. I do not see anyone warming up in the Gateman bullpen. But these are pretty low-pressure pitches that Dyer's throwing. He has a five-run lead, and for the most part, he hasn't had anyone on base. There's a look at the Gateman bullpen. A bit concerned, I see a stray flame that is away from the main bonfire. Never know what's going on down there. Something that I hope to have a little bit more clarity on, uh, we have a broadcast that is being done by Fox College Sports, so we'll have the night off. Bouncing ball over to Grand Prix at short goes the easy way to Robertson, who's covering second base. Four up, three down for Grant Dyer. He gets through the eighth inning after hitting Bennis with two outs. Bottom of the eighth, eight, nine, and one for the Gateman on the Cape Cod Baseball League Network and WCTV. Bottom of the eighth inning, we'll see a new pitcher, but before we identify him, Megan O'Brien joins our broadcast for the second time. Happy birthday, Megan. <laughs> Thanks, Jake. And you guys were mentioning before, Grant Dyer, I heard you say, should get player of the game. And I have to give a third to that vote. Grant Dyer has been outstanding tonight. And he's used to coming in to games in late relief situations. And tonight, he had to alter that approach with the early departure of Zach Houston. And uh, he's been outstanding. I spoke to him early in the season. He said he was not highly recruited out of high school, but he's developed into one of the lead closers at UCLA, I'm sorry, one of the lead setup mans at UCLA, one of the best in the game, according to his scout report. And he's proved it here for the Gateman, but tonight came in a little bit earlier than expected and has just dominated, continued to dominate. Look to see more of that progression in the ninth inning. Back to you guys. Thank you, Megan. I would likely assume that Grant Dyer will be out onto the ninth. He will be in line for the win as his team has staked him a 5 nothing lead. The new pitcher will identify him, a big presence for the Falmouth Commodores, Ben Anchef. Bats left-handed but throws right-handed, 6'2", clocking in at 300 pounds. And if he plunks you, you do not want to charge the mound. Out of St. Thomas University. Gotten some national press. Grand Prix takes a first pitch strike on a fastball. Really is a cool story. He was born eight and a half pounds at birth prematurely, and he had an underdeveloped heart and lungs. There's an experimental procedure that quite possibly saved his life. And that he is here now is no small feat. Here now performing in the top college baseball program, or rather league in summer baseball, and he's excelling too. This will be his fifth appearance, has thrown seven innings, struck out six batters, ERA inflated at 6.43. Trying to work through the Gateman bottom portion of the order. One two pitch to Grand Prix, a curveball, an off speed pitch in the dirt. Grand Prix does not go around. Ben has the resting heart rate of a marathon runner. And a Highly decorated athlete in high school. Two-time All-State defensive tackle, surprise, surprise, and defensive lineman of the year. 
100 wrestling wins, two-time Southeast Regional Champion and three-time District 11 Champion out of Williams Valley High School. Pitching record in high school, 20 and 5, 224 strikeouts. He's jumped around a little bit. St. Thomas, the third institution of higher learning at which he has thrown baseballs. University of Georgia, State College of Florida, actually the fourth, University of Central Arkansas as well. And instead of pumping cheddar, showcases some finesse. Grand Prix down swinging on a breaking ball. Bottom of the eighth inning, Gateman have a 5 nothing advantage. The pitcher here in Ben Anchef, fifth pitcher for the Commodores. Looked like the Gateman would use a lot more than five pitchers as Robertson takes strike one. Crook departed after two innings as expected. They were then expecting to ride Zach Houston for much of the rest of the way. Instead, Houston threw only a few pitches and departed after he had thrown two balls and walked Logan Ice. Ever since then, though, Dyer has been close to perfect. And Jeff from the windup is one and one pitch, a strike on the outside corner. Up next for the Gateman is a road matchup against Bourne tomorrow. They'll come back home on Thursday against Hyannis, then. Again on the road at Brewster, then it's the all-star game that we've been talking about quite a bit. Both of us will be members of that broadcast. Megan will be helping out Fox Sports in their broadcast of the game. Should be a fun one and a good end-of-the-season treat for journalists everywhere and scouts as well. Not only is this the premier summer league, but having all the top prospects in one place and the guys who are performing the best at a given time, that'll be a lot of fun. Robertson out in front on a breaking ball into left field for Longo. Two outs in the bottom of the eighth. We've seen Anchef go two up, two down here in the bottom half of the eighth inning. He is a very talented pitcher. Let's not let that get lost in our discussion of what makes him peculiar. I mean, you you look out and you see a 300-pound pitcher. That's not something you see every day. But he's here for a reason, and he's a very, very talented pitcher. We hope he goes on to the next level. Kalika through the six hole. Three for five now is Andrew Kalika. Any semblance of him starting to slump with an 0 for 11, promptly a race. 2 for 4 last night, 3 for 5 tonight. Everything he's hit has been on the screws. Right. Jabs. Jabs would like to get a hit in a game that his team's winning 5 nothing. He hasn't had much to do with it. 0 for 3 a walk and was caught stealing. Anchef from the stretch. Kalika takes off. Here's the throw into second base. It was in time, but Kalika knocks it out of the glove of Caleb Hamilton. Second stolen base for Kalika. He has now successfully stolen his past six. Now Logan Ice out to have a word with Anchef. Kalika's value to the Gateman certainly showcased tonight. Two RBIs, so performing in clutch situations. A run score, two stolen bases as well. At the time, made a nice catch in center field in the fourth inning to preserve a no-hitter going into the fifth. Of course, that no-hitter has ceased to exist, but the Gateman will certainly take Grant Dyer's performance. And Kalika's back safely into second base. Mm -hmm. 
Anchef set at the belt. Slide step move into home plate. Ball two. Due up for the Commodores in the top of the ninth inning. It's the top of the order. Caleb Hamilton, Boomer White, Evan Skaug. Their places in case they get pinch hit for. The 2-0 to Jabs. Grounded over to first base. Funky hop for Skaug, but he has it three unassisted to end the eighth inning. On to the ninth we go at Spillane Field. The Gateman three outs away from sole possession of third place. Ninth inning upon us at Spillane Field. It's been a pleasure to bring you this ball game. The Gateman having some pleasure as well. 5-0, a five-run cushion as Dyer gives way a spectacular performance for the right-hander. The left-hander, Ben Parr from Georgia Tech, into the game to close it out. First, the final tally for Grant Dyer. He went six complete, allowing two hits, no runs, and ten strikeouts. You wonder if he might be destined for a starting role at UCLA after his performance here this summer for the Gateman. Now for Ben Parr, lefty out of Georgia Tech. No decisions on the year, making his seventh appearance, sixth out of the pen, 2.89 ERA, three earned runs in nine and a third innings. Pinch hitter in the game. Andrew Snow will take the place of Caleb Hamilton in the leadoff position, so... Should the Commodores push across five runs, play second base at ASU, but can certainly handle his own at shortstop as well. Two for 37 this season. Like we mentioned earlier in the broadcast, the numbers, at least on the hitting side of things, certainly not there, but only going into his freshman season. See if he can start seeing the ball a little bit better, and he has of late. Takes two quick balls from par. Keep in mind that the Commodores have seen a five-run lead evaporate, so they know it's possible. That happened in the Commodores' last game as Snow skies one in the infield and playable for Sternagel, out number one in the ninth. A 6-1 lead over Hyannis in Hyannis evaporated in the ninth inning, and that game went to 12 innings. And, and then the lights had enough. The, the lights turned off at... 11 o'clock, I believe it was. No, 10 o'clock, because it was a 6 o'clock start. And then they had to wait for the lights to go back on. It ended in a 12-inning tie. Boomer White, the owner of an 0 for 3 day to the plate. First pitch fastball, first pitch strike from par. Nothing really jumps out of the stat line of Ben Parr. Nothing really jumps out of his arsenal either as Boomer White rockets one into center, but thanks to a 4-12 center field fence, Kalika tracks it down. The Gateman now one out away from their 14th win. That's out in South Yarmouth. That is out in South Yarmouth. I could probably hit it out at South Yarmouth, but you know, I think most people could. Very shallow center field there. I could sleep, sleepwalk my way to one out at South Yarmouth. Okay, <laughs> maybe not that. I could bunt out at South Yarmouth. Skaug, who definitely has the power to hit one out of a 4-12 fence. No question about South Yarmouth. He's 0 for 3, two strikeouts. Can't hit a five-run home run, though. So the Commodore's just looking for base runners at this point. Parr twirls a breaking ball. Not a lot of break, missing high and tight. Parr winds, delivers another ball. 3-0 and is the count to the three-hitter, Matt Ajevic, on deck. Parr set at the ears and misses for ball four. Skaug a four-pitch walk. Matajevic, the always dangerous Matajevic, into the left-hander's box. I believe that's uh, Mitch Longo coming up. Longo came in as a defensive replacement. So 
for all intents and purposes, a pinch hitter, even though the Commodores probably didn't anticipate this at bat meaning much. Longo was a defensive replacement for Boomer White, which leads me to believe that White then shifted over to right field. Yes. Because White hit this inning and made the second out to Kalika in center. Scow go over on first. The count evened up at one to Longo. Par the left-hander, getting set to deliver to the lefty Matajevic. In on the fist and right to Kisner at first base. Three unassisted to end this ball game. The Gateman take it by a final score of 5-0. to zero. Now sole possession of third place. They advance to 14-19-1. Meanwhile, Falmouth falls to 13-20-1. We are beginning to see some encouraging trends for the Gateman, even as they continue to struggle on the whole. They're winning games at home at a greater rate than they're winning games on the road, and they're also winning games in the division, which is going to be very important come these last couple weeks and potentially playoff time. We'll give you the rundown on everything that happened in this game in case you joined us late at any moment in the broadcast. The Gateman had two runs in the first inning thanks to the services of the new guy, Gavin Stepensky, who got the start at catcher, and in his first at-bat of the season for the team, a two-out RBI double that scored both Kisner and Kalika. So out to an early lead, the Gateman now advance to 11-6 when scoring first on the season. They then plated two more runs in the fourth inning thanks to a two RBI single from Andrew Kalika. Kalika stays mighty hot at the plate. Three for five, two stolen bases. Then the Gateman tacked on another run in the six, an RBI single off the bat of Kramer Robertson. That was the difference in this game. Five runs for the Gateman. The pitching staff, one that was of Matt Crook, Zach Houston, Grant Dyer, and then Ben Parr in the last inning combined for a shutout of the Falmouth Commodores. Final totals on the board are correct. Five runs on 12 hits, one air and seven left on base for the Gateman. No runs, two hits, one air, and four left on base for the Commodores. No quality starts were notched in this game, but the winning pitcher and likely player of the game was Grant Dyer. Six innings, ten strikeouts, did not permit any runs. The losing pitcher is Turner Larkins. No save either. Final time of the game, less than three hours, around two hours and 57 minutes. We back at it tomorrow on the road at Bourne, so a radio-only broadcast. Eric Bramer will be delivering you six innings of play-by-play. -play. Look for the post-game interview with head coach Cooper Ferris and Grant Dyer, player of the game, on our YouTube feed. Certainly will want to hear their thoughts on the 5 nothing win for the Gateman. So with that, we depart from Spillane Field. For my color commentator, Eric Bramer, our field reporter, Megan O'Brien, our broadcast director, Warren Randolph, and everyone here at the Wareham Gateman organization. We thank you for joining us on this Tuesday night. It was a fun one. Gateman take it by a final score of 5-0. to zero.